and me and thank you especially to Sam for having us on when we found out about Romancing the Gothic, we immediately thought we have to propose something to do with this project because it is just so fantastic. And I have learned so much from the other lectures and from poking around the site and I can't wait to participate further. So we are Colleen and Kendra and we have a brief bio here. Um, I will let Colleen speak about herself and then I'll introduce myself a little bit beyond this and then we'll get started. Sure, I, I'm a theater publicist in Washington DC and I used to be in academia specifically teaching Renaissance uh, uh, drama courses, teaching versions of the revenge tragedy course several times. Um, now I, yes, work, work in DC and I'm an arts and cultural writer around here and do occasional creative writing um, and Kendra and I have collaborated on several projects and I'm so excited to work with her today. And she always has fantastic projects upcoming. Oh, thanks. Um, I am trained as a musicologist and music theorist. And I did a PhD thesis on how music is used to communicate about madness in screen adaptations of Hamlet, Macbeth, and King Lear, which was a totally addictive project. And how can you not like a project where you sit on your sofa and watch movies all day and take notes? It was amazing. So uh, yeah, Colleen and I have done several conferences together and other things like that. And so while I started in music, I also do a lot in literature and drama. Um, my next upcoming work, I think, I think in addition to the, uh, the werewolf version of All's Well That Ends Well that I have called Mooncrust, I'm now thinking that um, I'm going to write a ghostly Christmas play. Um, and, and maybe I can entice some of you to follow me on Twitter so that when I have that done, we could do a Zoom reading or something like that. All right. So here we go. Great. So we usually think of the Gothic as beginning in 1764 with the publication of Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto, but the early modern revenge tragedies are proto-Gothic in their archetypal characters of aristocratic villains and victims, their setting of decadent but decaying palaces, and the recurring tropes that we'll get through. So as we talk today, um, those of you that either do 18th and 19th century Gothic novels or, or thinking ahead to contemporary Gothic, um, you know, I, I, we're just trying to kind of cover some of the basics and do an overview today of the major sort of illusions and influences that we'll continue to see later on. Emma Smith in Five Revenge Tragedies. I have all my books over here. Uh, so uh, Five Revenge Tragedies, she points out that all, all of our English Renaissance revenge tragedies deal with three recurring themes. Number one, the depiction and interrogation of justice. Number two, the analysis of death. And three, a playful engagement with theatricality. Recurring tropes include, there's a list, but there won't be a quiz. A Senecan ghost calling for revenge and justice, and a personification of revenge or the Furies, a secret crime committed, and the Avenger who must become a detective to discover who has committed the deed. The Avenger seeking illicit revenge because he cannot seek legal redress as the perpetrator of the crime is usually also an arbiter of justice, like a king or a duke. Interlocking revenges and counter revenges metatheatricality, often concluding with a death during a play or a mask, the avenger disguised with real or feigned madness, the royal court as a site for sexual pollution and political corruption, the tragic death of a virtuous young woman, low-born Machiavellian characters rising through the ranks, stoic in the Seneca sense, advisors or friends, the melancholic prince and the romantic lead, bad priests and monks, the skull as a mnemonic prop, poison, secrets, and purloined letters, dismembered body parts, the removal of the tongue, the avenger completing his act of revenge and announcing all of it only to then be killed. 
and new political power replacing the old corrupt power and attempting to restore order and justice. In the 16th century, first century Roman playwright and philosopher Seneca the Younger's plays became available in England in new translations and editions, and they were hot stuff. We've got madness, ghosts, witches, disguises, plays within plays, dumb shows, complicated plots and subplots, long soliloquies, spectacular violence for the sake of spectacle, like beheadings and dismemberment, cannibalism, like in the banquet shown here, the deaths of villains and accomplices and all of the Avengers themselves, all the stuff of the Gothic. Thomas Kidd, the playwright of the Spanish tragedy was called critically the English Seneca. The Renaissance revenge tragedies for all their grotesque spectacles. And by the way, content warning, we will have a, a few clips and some additional images that may be gory. So uh, just fair warning. Um, for all their grotesque spectacles, they're also highly literary um, and, and referring to themselves as literature. Characters are often reading from books, including commonplace books, a sort of Renaissance diary where people wrote down quotations uh, that they hope to learn rhetorical skill and flourish from. Um, the characters are often citing classical authors, often the original Latin in these plays as well. And many revenge tragedies of this time, Seneca is the touchstone. We see lines from his own revenge tragedies, uh, especially Thyestes and Medea, as well as his philosophical writings on tyranny, anger, and mercy alluded to and cited by characters over and over in these revenge tragedies. As far as we know, Kid's Spanish tragedy is the earliest English revenge drama. Scholars note that, the Spanish tragedy was one of the first and longest lasting Renaissance box office hits. Admired and often imitated, it was performed and reprinted over several decades. Between its first publication in 1592 and 1633, the play was republished 10 times, uh, including editions with the addition of new scenes written by Ben Jonson in 1602. There are over a hundred references, allusions, quotations, and parodies of Spanish tragedy in early 17th century literature, and only about 15 references to Hamlet, so quite the reverse of what we have now. Geronimo, roused from his sleep to discover his son's corpse hanging in his arbor, was better known than Hamlet holding the skull of Yorick. According to Philip Henslow's diary, it was staged 29 times between 1592 and 1597, during a time when plays were changed frequently and very few had successful revival. In 1619, the master of revels, looking over what plays might be suitable for presentation in the Christmas season of court revels that year, thought that the Spanish tragedy might make a good pairing with Hamlet. Perfect holiday fair, right? But as I mentioned earlier, there is this long tradition of Christmas being the time for ghost stories. The play was also translated into German and Dutch and other languages and was performed on the continent, particularly in Protestant countries. Emma Smith compares Renaissance revenge tragedies to the modern Hollywood film system. Uh, quote, the phenomenon of theater rivalry in the period from around 1598 to 1601 is mutually beneficial, is a mutually beneficial industrial partnership rather than bitter ideological and interpersonal competition, end quote. So even during those first few years, and here I want to point out, especially Hamlet, Antonio's Revenge, the Revenger's Tragedy, um, that we have all these plays being done right around 1601 for the first time, 1601, 1602. Uh, so Shakespeare's Hamlet around 1599 to 1600 performed at the Globe Theater by the Lord Admiral's Men. Henry Chettle's The Tragedy of Hoffman uh, performed in 1602 by the Admiral's Men. John Marston's Antonia's Revenge published in 1602, and it was actually a sequel to a romantic comedy he did called Antonio and Melita. It was performed by the children of St. Paul. So it was all teenage boys performing this super salacious, um, hyper violent play. And the expanded version of the Spanish tragedy with Ben Jonson's new parts are all performed pretty much concurrently um, at the major theaters. 
this may sound unbelievable, but I think we can compare this to like twin films that we see in modern Hollywood, right? Where we have the competition to release a film at about the same time. And so two different, uh, you know, um, Hollywood companies will go and try to get their film out first. So that's why in 1993, we have Wyatt Earp and Tombstone come out at the same time, or we have two major actresses playing the Wicked Queen. So we have Charlize Theron and Julia Roberts, both playing the Wicked Queen and Snow White and the Huntsman, or Mirror Mirror, which both came out in 2012. Or sometimes there'll be two films that are about Edwardian magicians or the illusionists and the prestige that come out at the same time. So I think the wonderful thing about the revenge tragedies and I do have a, a really long full list of all of them that we can share at the end of our talk is that the revenge tragedy is just like Gothic novels, um, that there's a sort of way to play with the formula, that we have the formula and we have the pieces that need to be in there, but we can keep subverting expectations and conventions. We can challenge the archetypes of what sort of characters we see. Um, and we can see the sort of changes that happen throughout. Um, eventually the Avenger becomes a villain figure himself. Um, so that is a major change. The Jacobean revenge plays even become more decadent and less moralistic than Elizabethan ones, which is hard to believe, but it really does happen. But eventually the brand becomes so diluted that even though we do have Renaissance revenge tragedies that go all the way up until the closing of the theaters in 1642, the brand just becomes watered down and repetitive. So um, Kendra and I agree that tis pity she's a whore, which is kind of Romeo and Juliet, but with incest instead of fighting families um, is our last great Renaissance revenge tragedy. Um, again, Emma Smith reminds us that the depiction and interrogation of justice is a central issue in revenge tragedies. Uh, Francis Bacon has a whole short essay. Um, I think it's only about three pages long. It's very short, um, but called On Revenge. And he says, revenge is a kind of wild justice. Uh, for Francis Bacon, revenge is okay if we've tried to get legal help first and we cannot for some reason. And that is what happens over and over in these plays. The stage and scaffold, as we see here, are the site of spectacle, of power, performance, justice, and death. Public drama and public executions are performed on the stage, on the, spec on the scaffold. Those terms are relatively interchangeable. This is the site where religious martyrs are tortured and obtain their power over the people as they die. Um, of course, for Foucault in Discipline and Punish, it's too far away for me to grab it. Um, the scaffold is the site of political performance. Tortures show the state spectacle of power and the sort of deaths given to different criminals often sort of replicate the different crimes against the state. In the Spanish tragedy, there's multiple scenes of the wicked punished by law or appealing for justice. So even with our first Renaissance revenge tragedy, this interrogation of justice begins. There's a public execution of the Machiavelli figure in that play as well. In the Revengers tragedy, the titular Avenger named Bendice and his accomplice brother Hippolyto, they're both arrested and sentenced to death at the end of the play after they've killed the Duke, the new incoming administration says, we don't need Avengers, there's law, there's judges, there's juries. Um, so they arrest the two uh, vengeance figures and sentence them to death as they restore law and order. Freds and Bauer, which this is a great sort of classic book, Freds and Bauer's Elizabethan Revenge Tragedy, 1587 through 1642. He points out that, quote, the Elizabethans who attended public execution as an amusement were used to the sight of blood and wouldn't flinch from it on stage, rather they would demand it, end quote. And we can of course think that these same theaters are being used for bear baiting, bull baiting, that real blood is being used as a stage prop. 
And the last thing I want to point out is that the first permanent scaffold for hanging criminals uh, in, in England, in London, uh, the Tyburn uh, tree predates the first permanent public playhouse in London by five years. They both go up in the 1570s. That same playhouse, James Burbage's The Theater, becomes a site where two Catholic priests are publicly executed by hanging in 1588, and also connecting to our um, recurring sort of anti-Catholic sort of propaganda in these plays as well. Revenge plays for all their grotesque spectacles are also highly literary. Characters are often reading from books like Colleen mentioned commonplace books, which are diaries and collections of mottos or speeches, sometimes sketches, sometimes things like recipes uh, and other miscellaneous kinds of collections of material. They frequently cite classical authors and often in the original language. In the Spanish tragedy, Virgil, Claudian, Crucius, Seneca, Lucretius, and the Bible are all quoted in Latin. And in the same play, the heroine Bellinteria writes a letter in her own blood of how she's being held captive. Her avenge, the avenging father Hieronimo is commissioned to write the wedding play for the unwilling Bell Imperia and the murderous prince, and thus becomes the author and actor. Unlike the mousetrap in Hamlet, where the play is used to elicit and prove Claudius's guilt, the play is the thing where, and I'll catch the conscience of the king, here the play, Solomon and Persida, is the vehicle to enact revenge. As the characters perform their scene, they actually kill each other on stage. Their knives are real, the blood is real. So you can imagine how disappointed audiences would be seeing Hamlet, knowing that the play within the play is where the Avenger often achieves his vengeance in a big spectacle. But instead they see a dumb show and only a brief speech interrupted by Claudius and Gertrude that ends far too quickly. Hamlet and Polonius have an exchange about what Hamlet reads, words, 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 and Ophelia is reading on a book in their big breakup scene. In act two of Antonio's Revenge, Antonio does Hamlet cosplay. He wears all black, he flings himself a sofa, across a sofa in a typical melancholic pose, and he reads aloud from Seneca. So here are, is a list also of what we've got in terms of literary objects. So we have the Senecan tragedy, we have wills, secret letters, stolen letters, fake letters, letters written in blood, letters returned unwillingly, all sorts of letters. We have poisoned books, including poisoned Bibles, other dubious uses of the Bible, like to smack people around, the commonplace books, the plays and the plays within plays, and books of plays by Seneca. So it is a huge sort of omnivorous, self-feeding, self-propagating creature. So if anybody would like to volunteer, and don't feel like you have to, but if we have three volunteers to read this literary scene from Titus Andronicus, that would be great. Anybody? You can just unmute and say me. I can. Excellent. Is that Sam? Thanks, Sam. Uh, can you be Titus for us? Yes, thank you for all of the lines. <laughs> yes, I can. Do we have a volunteer for Marcus Andronicus? I will. Awesome, thank you. And then young Lucius. It's just two lines. All right, I will read young Lucius. <laughs> Do I just, so how whenever we... you're ready. I'll, I'll read the stage directions for us. So Titus Andronicus, Perfect. act four, scene one. Lavinia turns over with her stumps. Um, her hands have been cut off. We'll get back to that in a moment. Turns over with her stumps, the books which Lucius has let fall. How now, Lavinia? Marcus, what means this? Some book there is that she desires to see. Which is it, girl of these? Open them, boy. Thou art deeper read and better skilled. Come and take choice of all my library, and so beguile thy sorrow till the heavens reveal the damned contriver of this deed. Why lifts she up her arms in sequence thus? I think she means that there was more than one confederate in the fact. Aye, more there was, or else to heaven she heaves them for revenge. Lucius, 
What book is that she taught us though? Grandsire, it's Ovid's Metamorphoses. My mother gave it to me. For love of her that's gone, perhaps she culled it from among the rest. Soft, see how busily she turns the lead. What would she find? Lavinia, shall I read? This is the tragic tale of Philomel, and treats of Terius treason and his rape, and rape, I fear, was root of thine annoy. Oh, thank you all. Well done. Um, in Titus Andronicus, Ovid's tale of Philomela, these last few lines that we have here, partially inspires um, the, the horrible cruelty that the rapists Demetrius and, and Karen uh, inflict upon Lavinia. They not only cut out her tongue so that she can tell of her rape, but they take it a step further. Um, they cut off her hands as well, so she cannot weave their villainy as did the mythical figure of Philomel. Lavinia is able to use her nephew's, uh, his schoolboy text of Ovid, as we see here, however, to explain what has happened to her. Philomela's mode of revenge, uh, working together with her sister, they, they take the son of uh, the rapist and they chop up the son and serve him as a meal to his own father uh, so that he has to eat his own flesh and blood. And then all three of them are turned into birds because it's Ovid's metamorphoses and everybody turns into birds pretty much. Um, this story is going to inspire the revenge that Lavinia and her father Titus are going to enact at the end of the play as well. So there's in Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus, Ovid is the lingua franca. Everybody in the play knows this particular myth. And so they keep reinscribing it in different ways for their own nefarious rewritings of their various revenge plots. Um, the plays, of course, all deal with the meta theatrical. Again, uh, referring back to Emma Smith, three main points about these Renaissance revenge tragedies. She says they have a playful engagement with the theatrical. Um, here on the right, we see um, uh, Horatio hanging in the arbor from the Spanish tragedy. So I just wanted to point out what that image is. So we have um, Kendra will go over some specific examples, but just a quick overview of some of the major things we see over and over. The plays within plays, we see a series of dumb shows. We will have mask, which really sort of developed during the Jacobean period. We have the play as the site where the final vengeance occurs. Uh, we have disguises, a lot of characters uh, dressed up as other people. We have feigned madness. And we have breaking of the fourth wall, often by that Machiavellian um, lowborn figure sort of rising up, but often by our adventure figure as well. Specific examples include the Spanish tragedy, which is a double play. It starts out with a ghost and the figure of revenge watching a play being enacted that shows a history. And then there's another play within that play. There's the mask in Women Beware Women, and I'll show a clip in just a minute. There's a mask that ends the Revengers tragedy. And of course, there's the mousetrap, the murder of Gonzago in Hamlet. I want to talk just a second about the mask because this is a really interesting form of theatrical participatory entertainment that rises up in the courts where spectacle is the whole point of, of the game. But it's not just theatrical disguises or costuming. There is a huge amount of music. There's often a theme or a primary story that's being told. Women here could act uh, and take on roles often in the, in the privacy of these entertainments. There's choreographed dancing as well as regular dancing. There's just all sorts of stuff going on. These were enormous entertainments that would, would last all night. So in the scene I'm about to show you, this is a production of Women Beware Women. And here, of course, the mask is the site of revenge. So I'm gonna sum up what's going on here so it makes sense when you see it. Bianca, whose husband was murdered by the Duke of Florence, is forced to marry her husband's killer. At a mask to celebrate the marriage, a number of secret affairs and murders come to light. Hippolito, who is having an affair with his niece, Isabella, is shot with poison arrows and impales himself on a sword. Isabella poisons her aunt with incense. Livia pours liquid gold on Isabella. Bianca plans to poison the cardinal, but the 
Duke drinks the poison. Bianca kisses the dead Duke and then finishes his poisoned drink. I'm sure that is perfectly clear. Really the spectacle and all of the death is what is important here. So let me pull up this video, which I have right here. Okay, let me see if I can expand. Nope, that is absolutely not what I wanted to do. I want to, I don't want to do that either. This is where you can see me. Here we go. Ah, no. Here we go. There's the molten gold. How brother Jones never denies us of his burning treasure to express bounty. She falls down upon her. What's the conceit of that? As overjoyed, he like. Uh, too much pleasure overwhelms us all, and she has her lap full, it seems, my lord. This swerves a little from the argument, though. Look you, my lord! These are poisoned incense. Oh, fast. Now comes my part to toll him hither. Then with a given stamp, he's dispatched as cunningly. Stark did. Oh, treachery, cruelly made away. Uh, uh, how's that? Oh! <laughs> Look, this one of the lovers dropped away, too. But surely this plot is drawn forth. Here's no such thing. Oh, 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 I'm sick to the death. Let me down quickly. Oh, this fume is deadly. I'm sure we all have a lot of questions and, and thoughts about that. So what we can return to that um, later. So this is the play within a play from the Spanish tragedy. Um, 
avenging father, Hieronimo, writes the marriage play for the wedding of Belimperia and Lorenzo, who with his friend Balthazar, killed Hieronimo's son and Belimperia's lover, Horatio. Hieronimo casts himself in the role of a hired murderer. During the play, Hieronimo's character stabs Lorenzo's character and Bell Imperius' character stabs Balthazar's character and then kills herself. When the play is finished, Hieronimo reveals that he and Bell Imperia used real knives and that Lorenzo, Balthazar, and Bell Imperia are now all dead. He tries to kill himself, but the king and viceroy and duke of Castile stop him. He then bites out his own tongue and then finally, after tricking the Duke into giving him a knife, he stabs the Duke and then commits suicide. So we're hoping uh, we could get four volunteers because we would like to try reading this using, uh, figuring out how they would perform this sort of scene in the Renaissance. This is all about experiments and trial and error. And like the scene that we just saw for the end of Women Beware Women, if our tragedy becomes more of a farce, that's completely fine and expected. Um, but if we could get four volunteers, I would like to have one person play Great Solomon, the Turkish emperor, if anybody's feeling especially uh, empirical today. Um, if you have a hand up, I'm kind oh, of curious. I can do that. I can do that. Is this Rashika? Yes. Okay, great. I will send you uh, that in just a minute. Or do you have those, Kendra? Are you able to send? I can put them in the chat, I believe. Okay. Thank you so much. And secondly, um, if we could have Erastus, the Knight of Rhodes. Yeah, sure, I can do that. Thank you. Is it Daru? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, uh, Kendra, the uh, Solomon is Baltazar's role. Right. Uh, Erastus is Lorenzo's role. I'm trying to find the appropriate chat window. Hang on, here we go. Lots and lots of windows. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna put all of these um, in the chat. So I am putting in Balthazar's Bell Imperia's. Let's see, I'll do Bell Imperia next. It looks like they're showing up in the chat window. Is that correct? Lorenzo and Yes, I, I see them in the chat window. So Rashika, if you could open up the one that says Baltazar, that will be your part. And I'll explain how this all works once we have everybody cast. Uh, Daru, if you could open up the one that says Lorenzo. And if we could have somebody who wants to play Prusetta, who is chaste and resolute. You don't actually have to be chaste or resolute. You just have to be able to perform that. I'm happy to dive in again if no one else wants to. Okay, all right, so Sam. And we need a murderous Basha, Basha, how do we say that? Um, Sam, you'll have Bell Imperia's part. I can do it again if no one else wants to volunteer. Oh, Sally, I think you're, you'd be perfect for this murderous role. So if you could open up Hieronimo, that would be fantastic. So you each have your own script. We're going to take a, a short break. So this allows uh, these members to look over their, their sort of lines. Once we come back, I'll explain how this works. I think Sally has a little bit of an advantage because they have taken classes with me before and has done this sort of thing. So um, we've done this, but as Simon Palfrey and Tiffany Stern explain in their groundbreaking work on early modern theatrical practices, 
it's the book called Shakespeare in Parts. They say each actor has his or her own part, their own part, right? The text an actor receives and learns from in a very real sense owns. Um, that text contains on it all the words the actor was going to speak, but nothing that would be said to or about them. So you just kind of have your own lines, but not the full scene. So we'll, we'll take a few minutes so that we can do this. Um, I will re-explain before we get into it how this will work. Um, and then for the rest of you, we thought during this break, this might be a time we also have the Duchess of Melfi, which we'll turn towards at the end. And we thought this might be a good time for other people to look over this uh, short scene we have from the Duchess of Melfi as well. So we'll give you about 10 minutes and then we will come back. Perfect. Are you okay to stop sharing just in the break? I am, I will stop the share. Thank you. All right, there we go. I'm going to mute and stop my video and we'll be back in 10 minutes. So 1253. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if you've re-put the Duchess of Malfi, but if you guys go to that link, you'll be able to find the Duchess of Malfi. Um, it's, it's just one scene, so it's not it's not a long a long thing that you'll have to work through. Geronimo, who's our Avenger figure of in this play, the Spanish tragedy, he is asked to write the wedding mask. And so he uh, writes this for Bell Imperia, who's going to be his co-Avenger and the two villains, Baltazar and Lorenzo. And he says in act four, scene one, and here, my lords, are your several aspects drawn for each of you to note your parts and act it as occasions offered you. And then he also hands out like a fake mustache and a sword and some basic costumes and props to the characters. So the part that Hieronimo hands out, again, this is how Renaissance plays were done, is that you don't ever have the full script. You actually only have your lines and what's called a cue, which is just the few words before you speak. So I've given you that. So if you're Lorenzo and it's your part to speak, you might have Baltazar a few lines before you and just the last few words that character says, and then that will cue you in to prepare. So this is how uh, plays were done because it was, you didn't print a play until after it had been performed and either it was successful or maybe it wasn't successful and you decided to try to make some money uh, through the printing of it that way. But actors never had full script. You really just only had your lines. To complicate things in the Spanish tragedy, the parts that Geronimo hands out, he hands out one part in Latin, one in Greek, one in Italian, and one in French. But we're simplifying it in that you all have English in front of you. So uh, just how to do this, I want you to move through your lines really quickly. Don't worry if you're mispronouncing, don't worry about that, that's completely fine. Um, most importantly is to listen. So even more important than getting your own lines correctly is listening for your cues so that you know when to speak. Um, so that's great. You, you, it's okay to not get all your lines correctly, that's fine. Just make sure you get those last few words of your line correctly. Otherwise, the next actor does not know to speak. Um, if possible, pay attention to embedded cues. So there's our implied gestures or actions. Um, so example, there's very little stage directions at this time, right? Um, we usually have enters, exits, kisses, stabs, dies, pursued by a bear. Otherwise, we really don't know what a character's doing unless they tell us, they'll announce it in their speech. So if they say, you know, give me your hand or I stab myself, you know, sword, find my breast, then you know, ugh, that sort of thing. So looking for those sort of embedded cues. And then I'll, I'll jump in and act as prompter. Um, I think if, if anything goes really awry, but that's also okay. So I will mute myself now. And um, I will give the opening uh, from the Spanish tragedy for this play. Geronimo gives 
uh, the king a book. Gentlemen, this play of Hieronimo in sundry languages, again, the Latin, Greek, French, and Italian, was thought good to be set down in English more largely for the easier understanding to every public reader. And Baltazar enters. Um, so, be sure that shows is ours, yield heavens the honor, and holy Mohammed, our sacred prophet, and be thou graced with every reflex, uh, with every excellence that Solomon can give or thou desire. But thy desert in conquering Rhodes is less than in reserving this fair Christian, Persida, blissful lamp of excellence, whose eyes compel, like powerful adamant, the warlike heart of Solomon to wait. Whatever joy earth yields, betide your majesty. Earth yields no joy without Persida's love. Let then Persida on your grace attend. She shall not wait on me, but I on her. Drawn by the influence of her lights, I yield. But let my friend, the Rhodian knight, come forth. Arasto dearer than my life to me, that he may see Persida, my beloved. Ah, my Arasto, welcome to Persida. Ah, thrice happy is Arasto that thou livest. Rhodes' loss is nothing to Arasto's joy. Sith as Persida lives, his life survives. Ah, Bashaw, here is love between Erasto and fair Persida, sovereign of my soul. Remove Erasto, mighty Solomon, and then Persida will be quickly won. Erasto is my friend, and while he lives, Persida will never will remove her love. Let not Erasto live to grieve great Solomon. Dear is Erasto in our princely eye. But if he be your rival, let him die. Why, let him die, so love commandeth me, yet grieve I that Erasto should, show, so, should so die. Erasto, Solomon saluteth thee, and lets thee wit by me his highness will, which is thou shouldst be thus employed. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, me, Erasto, see, Solomon, Erasto slain. Yet live it, Solomon, to comfort thee. Fair queen of beauty, let not favour die, but with a gracious eye behold his grief, that with Persida's beauty is increased, if by Persida his grief be not released. Tyrant, desist, soliciting vain suits. Relentless are mine ears to thy laments, as thy butcher is pitiless and base, which seized on my Erasto, harmless knight. Yet by the power thou thinkest to command, and to thy power Persida doth obey. But were she able, thus she would revenge thy treacheries on thee, noble prince. Stop, stop, stop. Um, and on herself she would be thus revenged. Stop, stop, stop. But Bellimperia plays Persida well. Mary, this follows for Hieronimo. Here break we off our sundry languages, and thus conclude I in our vulgar tongue. Happily you think, but bootless are your thoughts, that this is fabulously counterfeit. And that we do as all tragedians do, to die today for fashioning our scene, the death of Ajax or some Roman peer, and in a minute, in a minute starting up again, revive to please tomorrow's audience. No, princes, no, I am Hieronimo, the hopeless father of a hapless son, whose tongue is tuned to tell his latest tale, not to excuse gross errors in the play. I see your looks urge in instance of these words. Behold the reason urging me to this. See here my show, look on this spectacle. How can you brook our play's catastrophe and here behold this bloody handkerchief in which Horatio's death I weeping dipped within the river of his bleeding wounds. It as propitious, see, I have reserved and never hath it left my bloody heart, soliciting remembrance of my vow with these, oh, these accursed murderers, which now performed my heart is satisfied. And to this end the Basha I become, that might revenge me on Lorenzo's life, who therefore was appointed to the part and was to represent the Knight of Rhodes, that I might kill him more conveniently. So, boy, Viceroy, was this Balthazar, thy son, that Solomon, which Belimperia, in person of Persida, murdered, solely appointed to that tragic part that she might slay him that offended her. Poor Belimperia missed her part in this. And princes now behold Hieronimo, author and actor in this tragedy, bearing his latest fortune in his fist, and will as resolute conclude his part, and, gentles, thus I end my play, 
urge no more words. I have no more to say. Well done. I forgot. So Hieronymo's speech, I've already cut that down quite, <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, he talks quite a lot about the sort of revenge that he's enacted and explaining um, how he has killed everybody. Um, and then he cuts out his own tongue. He says, like, I've, I've told enough, and he cuts out his own tongue. So um, that starts uh, that, which we end up seeing in several other revenge tragedies. So for any of those, um, yes, thank you to all the volunteers. Fantastic job. Um, does anybody want to comment or raise questions about how these early modern parts work, or, or those of you who have performed? Was there anything uh, this actually went really well. It flowed much easier than, than sometimes it does. So well done. Yeah, so Sam says it's not as tricky as, as I thought it would be. I was wondering if the sort of there was the room for like ad libbing and if that happened in these kind of situations or not really because I know you, you know from the manuscripts that we have we have all of the the authorly changes or whatever and I'm wondering kind of how much of that would have been because in rehearsal or in performance there was kind of ad libbing going on. Sure um it seems that we have a lot of room for ad libbing and improvisation as long as you still end with your last few lines so the next person knows their cue again. Um, so Hieronymus speech that Sally read is incredibly long and I really just again uh, cut that down so we could just get to the parts where they say look this is how the play worked out and now all, all your children are dead on stage um, sort of thing. But uh, yeah, that, that there seems to be a lot of improvisation, which of course is what Hamlet tells the actors not to do before the mouse trap. I think we might have another. Oh yes, and, and Daru says, having your own cue script, and you can find these um, online for Shakespeare's plays. There's a lot of places that you can get just uh, the cue script versions for short scenes uh, for Shakespeare plays. Yeah. It, it keeps it really related to you to just have only your parts, right? That it's really, uh, it puts you in the moment instead of you memorizing everything. You really have to act about it in real time. And I think it shows us when we looked at that scene of the end of Women Be Were Women too, um, how all those actors, if they had only had their own cue script and each one of them is trying to plan their own revenge tragedy, how everybody sort of, uh, all the bodies pile up as they're doing their different versions. Kendra, is there anything you wanted to add about? I just, it went really, really well. You were all great. And I love the stabbing and the curtains. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yeah, like Colleen says, this is our, things would have been, and, and if you're the actor who's brought in at the last moment, you know, if you haven't had much time to rehearse, then your surprises on stage will be pretty natural, I think. So, um, and even, you know, even in live theater now, each time something is done, it may be, you know, completely choreographed, but there might always be these, these small gestures and there's room, I think, for movement um, that makes things you know, really exciting. All right, so we will keep going. So here we are all about the spectacle. So as we talk about this, you can think about how this might've been applied to the scene we just read, right? There's a corpse on stage and, and all sorts of things. So I'll let Colleen get started here. So one of the things, um, even in the stage direction, uh, Sally had you know pulled aside a curtain um, and only Sally could see what was on the line there, which is the body of Hieronymus' son, uh, Horatio, is now rotting on stage um, and displayed for everybody in the audience. So this spectacle of, of our bodies everywhere. Again, going back to Emma Smith's uh, three points, uh, the analysis of death. 
So I one contextual place I want to put this is within the wonderful year of 1603. It's one of the, the great plague years of uh, English history. But during that year, at least 30,000 Londoners died of the plague. And then between 1603 and 1610, there's a series of recurring plagues and the consistent cycling means that the theaters were closed more often than they were open for almost a decade. The plague informs the rhetoric of putrefaction, decay, death, and rot in all of these revenge tragedies. Right? Uh, there's something rotten in the state of Denmark is politics, it's the body rotting, it's the smell of, of death and decay, and um, you know, uh, plague sores exploding. So where are all the plague plays? We actually don't have too many plays that are specifically about the plague, um, but uh, Melissa Smith in the Playhouse's Plague House says, when we look at the revenge tragedies, this may be a way where people are dealing with the trauma of the plague and, and doing this through these dec decadent spectacles. Uh, she says, Revenge tragedy seems an obvious candidate for a site of the plague's impact because of its biologically graphic plots. A single character's thirst for blood in the beginning of play results in a stage littered by bodies at the end. Right, so she is making that diseased flea and our avenger alike in her reading. Quote, Thus, some revenge tragedies may be said to be about the plague insofar as they reflect the narratives constructed by early modern discourse to explain the plague, the reason for its presence in human societies, the methods by which it was transmitted, and the ways in which it killed. Karen S. Codden in Necrophilia and the Revenger's Tragedy, which is a great article, chapter article, argues that, quote, the intersection of death and the erotic throughout Elizabethan and Jacobian tragedy is a virtual commonplace of the genre, from Hamlet's leap into Ophelia's grave to the perversities of Turnour and Middleton, the body of death is at least symbolically conflated with the body of desire. Necrophilia yokes together science and seduction. Discipline does not replace the unruly erotic, but instead precariously displaces it and the elision of the body by the cold medium of the scientific gaze. So as Colleen has said, people are familiar with the, the, the way the dead body looks or the way the body starts to look as it is dying in the process of dying. The sights and the sounds and the smells of that get caught up in the way people have thought about the living body, that it's, you know, the way our skin looks or our eyes look, things like that. And in the late 16th and through the 17th century, memento mori jewelry um, and also decorations for the household and things like that became very popular. Not as much as we see, I think, in the Victorian period where it becomes really heavily gilded and um, present all the time. But this was still very popular because there's so much death going on, right? These items included mourning rings, pendants, lockets, brooches, they depict tiny motifs of skulls, bones, and coffins, in addition to messages and the names of the dead picked out in precious metals and enamel. Artwork from the time repeats these tropes of the skull, the time glass, father time or death personified, and a youth or a young woman with death. The, I, we start to see the trope of someone, you know, a young woman who is being led away by death or is dancing with death. And we see wings, which connote the speed of life, the ephemerality of youth, and the cross. So throughout, we have talked about Emma Smith, who has, whose work has really helped shape this talk. And I, I recommend reading everything she's done on it. It's really great. Um, but she talks about, again, the, the playful engagement with theatricality, and that happens too when we talk about corruption. We talk about political corruption and nations and states and governments and those in power being compared to the rotting corpse. The whole prologue to Antonio's Revenge, which we have coming up, is couched in this very frank, very graphic language of rot and death. 
Um, and there's also pushback against religious corruption, or at least there's an obsession with it, right? So because of what's going on in terms of politics and religion during this time period, Catholics are cast as not just bad and evil, but corrupting forces that they, that the veneration of, of death and bodies sort of presages their own rot and corruption. They're, they're shown to be, you know, some of the most immoral people on the stage, right? There are, there are really not very many good priests. We've got Friar Lawrence, but he's not in a revenge tragedy. It's a tragedy, and I guess it's got revenge, but it's not really a revenge tragedy, right? So, um, so we've got that going on. And of course we have the bodily corruption. Um, we have figures of ghosts walking around in these plays. We have seen set in graveyards. There's even um, a failed seduction scene where people are dressed like ghosts uh, in, in uh, the, the atheist tragedy, which is maybe the most bonker of the revenge tragedies. Um, bonkers being a very scholarly term that we use for this. Um, we have the dismembered corpses, right, that we have heads and hands uh, throughout these bodies, just scattered limbs, which often again go back to the, the political state that we have these bodies dismembered just as the state is being dismembered by different factions. We have necrophilia in several of these plays, the Second Maiden's Tragedy, um, and maybe the Revengers tragedy being two of the most uh, gruesome examples of that. And then generally the plays have a lot of uh, misogyny. I, Hamlet probably being the most sort of familiar example of his uh, real fear about his middle-aged mother having any sort of sexual appetite and agency. Um, but he also puts us onto Ophelia as well. So the sort of sex horror and then this sort of anti-cosmetic rhetoric that women are all sort of um, decaying vectors of disease that just paint themselves so that they are seductive, so that they're not much different than these skulls heads that we see. They just have better lipstick on. So um, we would like to read the prologue for Antonio's Revenge. So it's not a, a play that most of us know and that is completely fine. Um, but the prologue, I think we will hear how uh, gruesome the sort of language is right within this. So what we would like to do is just take a minute. This is something that um, I learned from the Royal Shakespeare Company when I was doing workshops with them for a few years. And it's something I often do with undergraduate and theater classes is uh, take a few minutes to read it by yourself and choose five words that you think really distill the essence of what's happening here. And there's absolutely no right or wrong words. It's just the five words that really speak to you about what you think this prologue might be about. Um, and make note of them. You can just try to remember them or you can jot them down. And then as we read, I will read the first half of this speech and then Kendra will take over at Who Winks. Um, as I read it, if we come across your word, just echo it back to me. So we will ask people to um, unmute themselves and it'll be chaotic as we do this sort of echoing exercise. But um, Kendra and I will just demonstrate this with the first two lines where Kendra has found the word rawish, uh, an important word for this. The rawish, Bank of clumsy winter ramps. And so you start to have this sort of echoing. So it doesn't matter what five words, but it's the five words that, that sort of speak to you. So we'll just take a minute to read this over and choose five words. Kendra, by the way, I'm going to choose five words from your side if you want to choose five words from my side. I will do that. Okay.
Okay. Do we have some words chosen at this point? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so everybody can unmute themselves if you want to join in and sort of echo. The more voices we have, um, the more cacophonous it will be, the more wonderful it will be. And I will begin. The rawish bank of clumsy winter ramps, the fluent summer's vein, and drizzling sleet chilling. Chill. Bleak cheek Bleak. of the numbed earth. Numbed. Well, snarling gusts. Snarling. 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 Ooh. <laughs> uh, nibble the juiceless sleeves from off the naked shuddering branch. Shuddering. And pills the skin from off the soft and delicate aspects. Oh, now. Methinks a sullen tragic scene would suit the time with pleasing congruence. 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 May we be happy in our week, Devore, and all our part pleased in most wished content. But the sweat of Hercules can ne'er beget so blessed an issue. Therefore, we proclaim if any spirit breeds within this round, incapable. Incapable of okay. weighty taste, passion. passion, 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 as from his birth, being hugged in the arms and nuzzled twixt the breast of happiness, nuzzled, who winks and shut his apprehension, apprehension, up from common sense of what men were and are, who would not know what men must be, must let such a hurry amain from our black visage black show. Black visage. We shall affright their eyes. Affright. But if a breast nailed to the Nail. earth with grief, if grief. any heart pierced through with anguish, pierced anguish, pant within this ring, if there be any blood, blood. blood. who is he is choked. 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 Stifled with true sense of misery. 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 If aught of these strains fill this consort up, consort. arrive most welcome. Oh, that our power could lackey. Lackey. Keep wing with our desires. Desires. That with unused piece of style and sense, we must weigh massy and judicious scale. Scale. Yet here's the prop that does support our hopes. When our scenes falter or invention halts, your favor will give crutches to our crutches. faults. Ooh, how wonderful was that? It's so eerie. It is, it's ghosts, right? It's a ghostly chorus supporting the readers. I love it. And it also allows us to hear, even for those of us that aren't familiar with the speech, right? Most of us have probably never seen a speech before. Probably I'll never see it again. That's fine. We are the Gothic, yes. Um, but you know, I could hear uh, the echoes of certain words like blood and misery and grief, where a bunch of us joined in at the same time for really strong echoes. So. Um, you know, I think it's a fantastic speech as it moves through, uh, it is meta theatrical, right? Cause it keeps saying, look upon our stage and you're going to see all these sort of things. Um, but the opening lines are some of the ugliest lines of verse as in it's really hard to write something as ugly as the rawish bank of clumsy winter ramps, the fluent summer's vein and drizzling sleep chilleth the wan bleak cheek, cheek of the numbed earth. Uh, that's really hard to do to write something uh, that grotesque. So um, wonderful job. I hope you all enjoyed um, this sort of, that the language itself is grotesque and sort of polluted and corrupt uh, following along with the politics and the bodily decay that we see throughout. I have to say my favorite part of this that makes it extra grotesque for me is we have the naked shuddering brand, which on its own could be very sexual 
right? But it's prefaced by snarling gusts, which and nibble the juiceless leaves. It's you know, it's just it's dry and desiccated, and gusts is close to guts. And then this part, it pills the skin from off the soft and delicate aspects, right? The words soft and delicate aspects are so beautiful. You expect it to be someone describing someone or something of beauty. But then you're thinking of the way the skin sloughs off the dead body. You know, I mean, it's just, it is a really amazing, amazing thing. So this brings us to the Reventor's tragedy. So uh, the Revenger's Tragedy from 1606 is written by Thomas Middleton. For a long time, um, scholars tried to figure out who, who wrote this piece. This is the general scholarly consensus now. The Revenger's Tragedy has had a successful contemporary performance in cinematic history. So a few uh, recent ones that you can find, you can find uh, production photographs from the Red Bull Theater's 2005 production. And then they did a rereading of it this summer to support the theater. Uh, Cheek by Jowl did the Revenger's Tragedy on stage, and it was the first play that they decided to translate to Italian. And they did that in March of last year and had planned to do it in the UK and then bring it to Italy um, before, of course, having to close down in March. But they do plan to tour Italy again with it uh, next autumn. And then this, uh, occasionally you can find a DVD of the Revenger's Tragedy, um, but you can't stream it currently. But this 2002 film of the Revenger's Tragedy, which is directed by punk auteur Alex Cox, who I love, who did Repo Man and Sid and Nancy. So he's like, you know, the best like old school punk rock dude. It stars Christopher Eccleston, Derek Jacoby and Eddie Izzard. Um, this is our very first stage uh, uh, stage description uh, for the play. Act one, scene one, enter Vendice holding a skull. And the skull will be this memento mori. It's going to be his reminder of revenge and not just death. And um, it's Kendra will talk about the skull is going to be fetishized. It's the object of beauty and desire. I think this play, um, and a few other ones, other ones that deal with necrophilia too, they ask what's more virtuous than a pure virgin or a chaste wife, a dead virgin. Right, it's super creepy. Um, I love this adaptation of the Avengers tragedy, but the ones for stage that Colleen mentioned are excellent too. Our first pictures of the slide of people dancing across the stage with with the big revenge or vengeance in the back um, is from the uh, Cheek by Jowl production. So I'll give you some lead up to this and then I'm gonna play the scene um, of, uh, that happens when Vindice starts to get his revenge. The background is, is that Vindice um, is, Vindice plans to marry Gloriana. In this film, it's shown as flashbacks the Duke poisons her at her wedding. She, she dies at the wedding um, and there's this huge scene of mourning, but uh, Vindice, true to his name, is out for nothing but vengeance. So in this scene, he has lured his enemy, the Duke, to a dark and creepy building where the Duke thinks he has a tryst with a beautiful young lady. But, what actually happens is that um, Vindice has set up the skull of his dead bride in this beautiful pavilion. The Duke kisses the skull thinking that it is a woman wearing makeup. So again, we have this anti-makeup kind of thing going on, but surprise, the skull is poisoned. And in this version of uh, Vindice also gives the Duke basically what is like poison Viagra, or it's just poison, but he basically says, this is Viagra, right? The skull is poisoned, the Duke's teeth are eaten away and his tongue begins to dissolve. Medici then tells the dying Duke that the Duke's wife and son are sleeping together and forces him to watch them have sex. Medici stabs the dying Duke and ultimately brags about his crime to the wrong person and at the very end of the play is executed. So again, here is, the Avenger who is killed at the end of the play. 
The skull is a big deal. There are so many scenes with the skull. There's one where Vindita is prepping the skull and he talks to it and he holds it against his chest and he has an altar just to the skull and he brushes its teeth and, you know, keeps it kind of moist. I don't know. It's, it, it is what it is. Anyway, um, so Scott McMahon writes, what could seem more fully oriented than a skull? Complete in itself, compact, like a moral couplet or pun, yet this skull returns as a beautiful woman for the Duke to kiss and is said to be an actor in its own revenge. So hopefully this clip will play. Are you fat? To say it. Ladyest thing, my lord, a country lady, a little bashful and fierce, that's more. Could you fat to say what is yours? What ladyest thing, my lord, a country lady, a little bashful and fierce, that's most of them are, but after the first kiss, my lord, the worst has passed with them. Uh, your grace knows now what you have to do. She's a somewhat grave look. No, oh, I love that best. Gravest looks, the greatest faults seem less. Eh? Give me that sin that's robed in holiness. Ooh, take this. <laughs> Twill stiffen your resolve. Cover your eyes, lest her beauty blind you. Madam, his grace will not be absent long. Truly secret. I heard another pair of lovers. I said her. Her voice is sweet. Secret? Never doubt us, madam. Twill be wear three velvet gowns to your ladyship. Pleasure dwells within a perfumed lip. Oh, oh, lady, sweetly encountered. Sir, be bold with me. Kiss my lips. Madam, I will. <laughs> what the? Royal villain. White devil. Brother, give us light. <laughs> that his affrighted eyeballs may start onto those hollows. Duke. To see yon dreadful visit. View it well. Tis the skull of Gloriana, whom thou poisonest last. <laughs> Poison me! Didst not know that till now. Treason! <laughs> my good lord! No! No! The last poor lecture in the hands of knaves. A slavish duke is baser than his slaves. My Hadst any left, then those that did eat are eaten. Oh, 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 my God! It will teach you to kiss closer, not like a slobbering Dutchman. You have eyes still? They hurt! The little pill I gave thee was a potion to prevent blinking. You cannot blink. I gave it that thou missed not one blinking moment of all this. It is but early yet. Now I'll begin to stick thy soul with ulcers. I will make thy spirit grievous sore. It shall not rest, but like some pestilent man, toss in thy breast. Mark me, Duke. Thou art a renowned, high and mighty cockle. Oh, not that kiss. Oh, taste of sin. Why, there's no blessing. Oh, sin. Nay, to afflict thee more. Here in this lodge, they meet for damn dead clips. Those eyes shall see the incest of their lips. Hello? Constant vengeance. 
the quaintness of thy malice above thought. <laughs> <laughs> So, as you see here, there's all sorts of great stuff you can uh, do with this scene, but I, I particularly love this one. I think it is just the right amount of gore and horror and is super gothic, right? The bower draped in white with the little fairy lights and what Christopher Eccleston is wearing. He's got this black coat, but they're long flowing sleeves like we would see in modern gothic. It's just fabulous. Also, it's, you know, the family that revenges together, stays together, you know, it's great family bonding sort of experiment too. Uh, our final thing, and this will be interactive as well, Kendra will go through um, what, what we we're hoping we can do with this is we want to turn to one of the great women centered uh, revenge tragedies, The Duchess of Malfi, which was first written in 1614 and published 10 years later by John Webster as a case study. T.S. Eliot memorably says that Webster, quote, always saw the skull beneath the skin, end quote. So this is the person, the playwright that, that we really wanted to conclude with today. You might remember John Webster if you've ever seen Shakespeare in Love. Um, right, so we have William Shakespeare, who's young and handsome and romantic in that version. And there's a little uh, homeless boy uh, who is John Webster, who plays with rats and he's sort of dirty and he hangs around uh, the playhouse and he says, I like it when they cut the heads off and the daughter mutilated with knives. Plenty of blood, that's the only writing. So even in um, Tom Stoppard's fantasy for Shakespeare in Love, young adolescent John Webster, we already see him as the sort of goriest of our revenge playwrights. Yeah, I love it. He says that Titus Andronicus is favorite because it's just like super disgusting and everybody dies. And, you know, he's also, it, it plays into the romantic aspect of the Gothic a little bit as well too, because he's always spying, he's spying on Shakespeare and Viola. Um, and he's the one, you know, who comes out at the end and, and sort of helps tear down the illusion that Viola has created of herself as a young man by saying, I saw him kissing her bubbies, you know, and then he goes back to like, you know, feeding rats to cats and things like that. So in this scene, which is in the chat, um, this is act four, scene one of Duchess of Malfi. Um, and in this scene, um, we're going to ask you all to read it and create a setting for us, create Think about how you might stage it. So the background here is that the Duchess has secretly has been widowed and has secretly married her steward Antonio as her second husband and has had children with him. In this scene, her brother Ferdinand and his servant Bosola are trying to drive the Duchess mad by showing her what they tell her are the artificial bodies of her husband and children. So we have the scene there and if you wanna take a few minutes to read it, we want to think about how you would design it in terms of the set, the lighting, sound and music, costumes and props. There's a severed hand in addition to the bodies. So some points to consider particularly about this play is anti-Catholicism, Ferdinand is a priest, uh, misogyny and cosmetics, the literariness of it, the fetishization of letters and books and things like that, and the eroticization of the grotesque, making the apparent dead body a performer. So we'll give everybody a few minutes to read it. We think about five minutes and we'll come back and start spitballing ideas how you all might set this. <laughs> <laughs> 